everybody. Welcome to Side of Lovertones. I'm P.T. Gazelle. My guest this time around is indeed a harmonica player and a pretty darn good one at that. But what almost everybody in the harmonica community knows about this guy is his attention to detail, his second to none craftsmanship, and the innovative products that he's been putting out for over a dozen years. Help me welcome in a true friend of the harmonica community, the founder and CEO of Blows Me Away, Greg Hume. Hey, Greg, how's things out in uh, California? They're good. We just had uh, a little cold snap. Uh, and cold for us is maybe 26 overnight. It's not the worst thing in the world. Yeah. Uh, but it means I have to actually turn the heat on in the garage before I start making microphones in the morning. <laughs> well, it could be worse, you know. You could be it asking could. if you want fries with that every morning. So <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. So I was looking at, uh, I went to your page today and was just kind of cruising around knowing we were going to be talking later today. Uh, 2004, right? That's kind of when you started Blows Me Away? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So what, I, uh, it, says, it says there that, you know, you had, you had left another career to do this. What was the other career? I did. I got my degree in computer science a long time ago, and I worked for a number of different companies in Silicon Valley. Uh, most people won't remember North Star Computers. That was the first one. It was I do. A, I had okay. one. I had North Star one. Was, the, was the business computer when Apple was just starting out as the personal computer in the microcomputer world. Uh, and I got recruited away from there to go to 3Com. And I joined 3Com in the early days. They were the developers of Ethernet local area networking, which grew into everything that we use today, pretty much the same technology, only faster. Uh, and, a, and a few other startups and a consulting practice for a while. And Did you have a clear idea about what you wanted to do or did it did it start with like some somebody coming over and saying, my amp doesn't work, can you fix this by any chance? Or I mean, what, I mean, what happened? Do you know, it's been just one happy accident after another. Uh, I was taking lessons from Dave Barrett way back when, and I was kind of thinking I wanted to do something, and I was also noticing at that time there were commercial mics didn't have volume controls, too many of them. Uh, certainly the only mic I had didn't. And I asked Dave if anybody made volume controls. And he said, well, there used to be the Switchcraft product, which are now prized collector's items and sell for $300, but you can't get them anymore. And I thought I ought to be able to make something like that. And uh, I did. And I started with a, trying to make a prototype with a rasp file spinning PVC pipe in my drill press and trying to make it look good. And it worked physically, but it was just butt ugly. Excuse me. But my dad was a hobbyist machinist since I can remember. And so I talked to him about it and he said, well, you kind of need some tubing and a bushing and a bushing and went to his house and learned to use the lathe a little mm -hmm. bit. That led me to the first product, you know, which is this, this volume control for screw on mics. Uh, so it's just a piece of aluminum tubing and some bushings to fit the connectors to, I don't know if you can see that, uh, and a volume pot and it works. And, and, you know, I've sold over a thousand of these things. Um, and Dave, bless him, was my first customer. He had uh, a shop through Harmonica Masterclass, and he started selling them. That helped those to get known. And uh, my dad said to me, you know, you can get lathes for next to nothing these days. I didn't know that. Lathes used to be American-made or British-made or German-made, and the starting point was $20,000. Well, now you can buy Chinese copies of those for very little money a few thousand dollars. Uh, and so I bought one and started making volume controls. And that led me to what else could I do mm -hmm. uh, with the machine? And that led me into the, the XLR, low impedance volume controls, and the wood mics and, uh, and more and more. And I kept trying to solve problems I was having as a performer. And then other performers started saying, hey, Greg, I need this, you know, can yeah. you can do something about this? Well, I think it's interesting. I mean, because, I mean, when I, when I look at your products, the ultimate 58, right? 
Yeah, I mean, did you look at the product and say, okay, this is a great microphone and it works great for harp, but it's so heavy. Couldn't I, isn't there something I can do here? Or I mean, I mean, or was it the volume pot? Or I mean, do you is that is that kind of how you go about solving issues or looking at, at new products? Yeah, I mean, in this in the case of the Ultimate Series mics, I was really pushed by two people, Jason Ricci and Chris Delbertone. Okay. And uh, Jason was performing with an RE10 microphone, which is quite long. And then he had my, he wanted a volume control. So this is the XLR version of the volume control. He had that plugged into the mic and then he had a wireless transmitter plugged into this end of it. And so it was as long as a baseball bat. Christelle at the time was up and coming and also really pushed me to machine the actual replacement barrel. Uh, and it was a big, you know, a big thing for me. I didn't have all those, that many skills as a machinist. Uh, so, so that one, you know, that one I was pushed a lot by the outside. I don't use the 57 that much personally. I'm a bullet guy and I sing through a 58. But since I have the ultimate 58, I did find that when I was singing, I like to eat the mic, right? I like to have it right here on my lip. But when I play acoustic harp, because I already have a bullet to play bluesy stuff, I want the mic in a stand and I want to get my hands in front of it yeah. to get a good wah. And uh, and so I actually needed to be able to turn the mic up for my harp solos and down for my vocals. And so I started using this instead, and a lot of other people have too for the very same reason. It's right. really really handy for that. Right. I, I do this. I do it with that as well when I'm when I'm using mine. Yeah. There's there's no doubt about it. So how did you do? You think because your father had that aptitude that you just kind of through osmosis got some of this to be a machinist? Because, I mean. You know, not everybody has that skill, man. Absolutely. I thank my dad for my mechanical aptitude uh, and a little bit of electrical knowledge. You know, he was a ham radio operator, too. And he taught me the fundamentals of amps and volts and watts and, and wiring and how to solder. So that's where that aptitude came from. And the rest was just I learned a little as I was going along and sure. learned what I needed to learn. Sure. Your attention to detail is is really it's as I said it's really second to none. I mean the stuff and I mean and and it's obvious that you you do the research up front before you release a product because I mean I'm looking at I'm looking at this again just to you know to show this again and it's like you put this out and from day one correct me if I'm wrong but it really hasn't changed right I mean this is this is right. it. And it and it right. still and it still works and it's still perfect. I mean, it just does what you what it's supposed to do. Let's let's talk about the Bulletini. Clearly, it's a runaway success. I mean, clearly. I mean, I don't. You've got to be selling. I mean, everybody's. It's the talk of. It's like the best new microphone, in what fifty years or something, man. I you know it's not for me to say except I'm I'm overwhelmed by its success. It turns out to be, you know, just wonderful for a lot of different reasons. It's so nice and small. Yeah. Uh, you know, if you compare it, this is the same. The wood mic is the same diameter as a JT30. Right. And the Bulletini is much smaller around. So what people are finding, first of all, uh, disabled people, women, children, pe men with small hands love it. But even people with bigger hands find that they have so much room left to change the expression uh, in their in their cup because it's so small and then it also has the element in it that that uh, I developed which naturally helps roll off the highs which is the cause of harshness and increase the bass which is something that we crave as harmonica players yeah you, uh, you, and so it's it's worked out really well yeah you've hit on you've hit on the point I was going to bring up and yeah the, the small part of the the small diameter is a really nice feature but when I played it, at spa and i'm not a guy that, that you know i'm not a real gear nerd okay i'm just not but when i played it there the, the immediately i thought well there's the low end that every every harmonica player is desperate to get you know and it's like it was already there it was i mean so you engineered that in through trial and error right yeah yeah, um, it, it again, happy accident. 
Uh, I was playing around trying to make uh, a smaller element <clears throat> and I tried a couple of different vocal mic elements because they're available. You know, part of our problem too is that the vintage elements are becoming more and more scarce and more and more expensive and there's no reliable supply. If you want to sell a thousand microphones in a year, you better have a reliable supply of elements. Um, <clears throat> so I found this particular element uh, that I made a modification to mechanically and electrically that turned into what the human element is. And I started with that first offering it in my wood mics. Uh, and then I discovered the shell that becomes the Bulatini and the human element just happens to be small enough in diameter that it could fit in that shell. Other, all of the kind of old vintage elements, the Shure CRs and CMs and crystals and the A-static crystals just won't fit yeah, too big. Uh, in, in the Bulatini, it's too small. Mm -hmm. But the human element does. And uh, as a result, it was a very happy marriage. Folks, you should go to his website. You're seeing the, the name here. If you're not familiar with Greg, and I can't imagine how you're, how you're not, but um, when you, you, you make an immense amount of, of uh, bullet replicas or a static replicas and you use a lot of wood. And I'm interested in this, is the wood you, is the wood you get mostly indigenous to the area you're in and is it, is it repurposed? Is it like wood people have, have found and bring to you or what, how does that work? I get, I get wood from all over the world okay. and some of it is harvested to be sold as lumber and some of it is uh, somebody's special family heirloom and everything in between. <clears throat> and as you as you begin to shop for wood, you find it's one of the, I don't know, it's like truffles or something where you have to kind of know people. Every once in a while then, you know, I have people now who will just say, hey, Greg, I got some really cool wood. This is redwood burl. Wow. And it's one of the most unique pieces of wood I've ever seen. It's absolutely stunning. Yeah. Uh, I never could have bought that piece of wood if I went looking for it. Well, do you so, do you ever do you ever try to talk a customer out of out of like I mean obviously to to a certain extent the resonance of the wood is going to make some amount of difference, isn't it? It does, but I tell people it's pretty far down the list of factors that are going to affect a mic's tone. Okay. The very first factor is the human being on the other end of it. Yeah. Uh, technique matters so much that everybody sounds different through the same mic. Yeah. But the element that's in it, the distance the element is from the front of the mic, the amp that it's connected to, et cetera, they all make larger differences. If I like pressed you and said, Greg, what out of out of the twelve years you've been in business? What's the what's the one product you're most proud of? What would you say? Wow. It's a toss up between the wood mics because to me they're not just functional, they're art. So I really like that and I have been improving my art. These mics have gotten better and better in quality over the years. Every time I'm always driven by that. How can I do it better? But I have to say, you know, the Bulatini is the biggest surprise in terms of commercial success. Um, mm -hmm. And so I'm, I'm awfully proud of that, too. I, I want to ask you this before we wrap it up. I mean, I know you play Seidel's. How, how did you who, who turned you on to Seidel products or, or just as a just as a kind of a, a business owner? Did you say, hey, there, it, I, I see this new product. I'm going to try it. Or I mean, what happened? I thought maybe stainless steel reeds would be my, my salvation. And I tried the Seidels, I loved the tone, the stainless steel reeds last forever. Uh, and I've been sold on them ever since, I just love them. I mean, I have some harps in my gig bag that I've had there for years and they just keep working. Yeah, I do too, man. I've got, I've got at least four that are, <laughs> I'm ashamed to say, seven years old, man. And it yeah, just, it just I, take keeps the same, I take the same ones to spy every year, and I hit Tom Halchak up for one of his cones. <laughs> so more and more of my main harps now are colored, and I can find them real easily in my box. <laughs> but they're 1847s. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's been great talking to you, Greg, and uh, I wish you the best, and keep up the great work, and uh, we'll see. I guess we'll see you this summer, man. I certainly hope so, PT. All great right, to bro. talk to you. Take care. Thanks. Bye-bye.